What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Random Red Shirt Podcast. I am Zach, one of the hosts, and the other host with me is Chris. How's it going, Chris? Hello, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining us around the world and in the interwebs again. Zach, great to be here. And Zach, you are rocking the next generation shirt. I love it. It's awesome. I mean, it's kind of fitting given the fact we're talking about Picard, right? Yeah, we just had season two. Excuse me, not season two, episode two. <laughs> episode two. <laughs> episode two of season, season three. three. Yep. Yeah, which is what we're talking about today. That's right. It just, just came out. So um, we're, it was, yeah, we really had an enjoyable time watching that. Yeah. And uh, for those of you watching on YouTube or listening, we thank you so much for tuning in to our show. Uh, we appreciate your listenership. Uh, you know, we've had a few more countries join the listener base, Chris. Uh, I believe the Czech Republic and uh, South Africa are now in our listening audience. So welcome for those of you in those countries. We, we appreciate you tuning in to us. Um, and this this episode is a little bit different in the sense that on our podcast, we have not uh, been a, a show that does episode by episode reviews of any particular tv series or anything like that but we had some discussions um you know off air obviously and we decided that you know picard season three special we really enjoyed the first episode and uh talking with doug i think doug drexler really got us fired up and we said you know what we know this isn't going to be 20 something episodes we have to review and this is supposed to be the final season so I mean, why not, right, right, Chris? Why not? Why not go through this journey with our listeners and talk through, uh, you know, this m potentially final voyage of of the gold standard of Star Trek and his crew? Yeah, this is going to be fun to talk through episode by episode. Um, I'm sure I'm sure we're going to have a lot of different feelings and reactions. And actually, today you and I haven't talked about our reactions at all on no, on episode we're going two, into it so, cold. So it is yep. going to it is going to be going going into it cold, which I like, which is going to be, be fun. So this is going to be completely fresh, like an original for us. So that's going to be good. Yeah. So if, if one of us seems surprised by the other one's comments, it's legitimately surprised. It's not, you know, we're not, you know, faking it or acting. Oh, I'm so, so surprised you said that, even though I already knew it was coming. We don't know what's coming. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to sharing our thoughts with you out there. And uh, if you have not, be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram and follow us on those platforms, uh, as well as YouTube. If you're listening, be sure to go on YouTube. You can catch the video version of what you're hearing. If you're on YouTube, hi. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in. We appreciate you jumping on YouTube. And uh, if you if you look at it and you say, oh, well, they've only got like 16 videos. Well, that's because the majority of our episodes are on uh, you know, your favorite podcast platform in audio formats uh, because we didn't start doing video right away. So be sure to go check out a slew of our other video or other episodes we've done in the past. Tons of great topics, tons of great uh, celebrity interviews, Chris, that they would miss out on if they didn't go tune in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're happy to be on all the platforms we on, we that we are on. And it, it is so much fun to be on the YouTube platform. And we're learning as we go. And yeah, are, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, and our YouTube, our YouTube platform is growing very quickly. So uh, for those of you out there who have subscribed to us here on YouTube and have been watching and following along, we very much appreciate that. We appreciate you supporting us on this new platform. Well, not new platform, but it's new to our podcast um, within the last month or so. So we appreciate that. But, you know, um, the first episode, as we look get into Picard here, uh, season three, episode two, the first episode of Picard. If you have not listened to our review to review yet of that, be sure to go listen to or watch that uh, on whatever platform you're you're listening to us or watching us on YouTube or or the other ones, uh, and check out our thoughts there. But uh, you know, going into the second episode now of season three, what what were your thoughts after that first episode, Chris? If you could kind of you know. I guess uh, sum it up in just a couple, uh, you know, a sentence or two. What were your thoughts, and what were some expectations you might have had going into the second episode? Uh, my my thoughts from the first episode were: I was extremely pleased to have Riker and Picard together, and like I said, like I said in our previous episode, I love the idea of a quest and companions coming together and going to help someone in need. So I love that as as a beginning kind of part for this season, um, and it made me 
optimistic and curious, you know, what this quest, what, what this quest is going to lead into. So those, those were my, my like o- overall, like ar- arching thoughts, very optimistic and yours. Yeah. Um, it was a great first episode. Uh, was it the greatest episode of Star Trek I've ever seen? No, but it was really good. I think for, for a season premiere, it was, it was pretty good. Um, the the interplay, like you mentioned, right, between Riker and Picard, I think was great. Um, there, there was a lot of awesome stuff in there. And it was interesting how they set it up, right? When you see this younger guy on board the ship that they, the, the, the Elios, right? Elios, uh, yeah. The, the, yeah, the Elios that they go on to and crushes in the stasis pod. And this this they, they get this kid out of this kind of holding area of some kind. Um, and he mentions that, that, you know, he's, he's a crusher. Right. And so, okay, well that leaves it open. All right. Well, Beverly's got a son. Yeah. Now fast forwarding into episode number two. Um, I had a lot of thoughts on my mind before I watch this episode of, okay, well, what if this means this, or what if that means this, um, that I was hoping I had answered some of it was answered, Uh, Of course, a lot is unanswered because it's only the second episode. Mm -hmm. So um, very, very good start to this new season. I think certainly uh, the first episode of season three was better than anything from the first two seasons. And you Uh, didn't. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe other than that, that 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 scene with between Picard and Q at the end of season two is very, very touching. And I loved your your analysis of that scene. It was very thoughtful and thought out. Um, but that was a, an incredible uh, scene. So besides that, I think it was certainly certainly better. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, and then season three, you know, if you haven't, I don't think either one of us feel like you had to have seen season one or season two uh, to watch season three. I think you could come in season three from what we've seen before. I think you could just come in season three if you haven't watched the other two and be fine coming in season three and just watching it fresh from there. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, th- there, there's a few things that would be helpful to know prior to season three, but nothing that I feel like is really backbreaking. Like, oh my gosh, if you don't mm-hmm. know this, you're not going to know anything about what's going on in season three. So I think you're right there. You could do both. I think, you know, we would probably both recommend still watching season one and two. I do think while we've we've mentioned that season one and two isn't our favorite, um, I, I still think there are some good things that came out of those first two seasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and we've mentioned that, right? We mentioned that in our reviews. So if you haven't listened to our review of season one, review of season two of Picard, be sure to go back and listen to those. Those are audio only. So you're going to have to go on to your favorite podcast platform to catch those. Um, and then obviously you can go YouTube or any podcast platform to catch our season three, episode one review that we did uh, about a week ago. So that being said, uh, we, we reviewed episode one. Let's jump into episode two, Chris, and let's take a look here at what we're getting next. Yeah, yeah, let's absolutely do that. So it looked like when we started episode two, that it actually, at the very beginning of episode two, looked like it took place two weeks before the events of episode one. It was like Mm -hmm. a little bit, a little bit back in time, right? And it it looked like the Elios, and we kind of see, and we were introduced to Jack Crusher, Looked like the Elios was on its way to a humanitarian like uh, task or humanitarian mission, and was going to a planet. I don't know which planet it was, but um, uh, they got so they're on their way. You know, they were stopped by some uh, some of the Fenris Rangers. So we got to see some of the interaction there, and a um, little bit of hu- a little bit of humor there. I'd, I'd say so. You got to see the the Fenris Rangers kind of interact with Jack Crusher, um, and you, I felt. Um, we got some personality with Jack Crusher, like in those yeah. in those few moments of of the scenes there. You know, we got to to see him show off those all those medical supplies and, and say, "Hey, he's on a humanitarian mission and he wants to uh, to help." Um, you know, we also got to see a little bit of some Romulan ale and and him, <laughs> yeah. you know, say that it was great. You know, it's perfect for antiseptic purposes, right? So, absolutely, <laughs> that's true. Um, and then you got to see him. Um, do a little bit of bribery here and there, you know, with the Fenris Rangers. So, so I thought that was I. It gave me a little bit of a. If I was to make some comparisons, a um, little bit of a Han Solo, Robin Hood, kind of you know feeling there. What what did you 
feel about that those those initial, initial okay months. yeah can i ask you a question chris yeah. yes when, when we were in la at some point unknowingly did you mind meld me because i was thinking <laughs> the exact same thing that whole scene at the beginning where we're two weeks in the past right and we're kind yeah. of building up to the moment where we are introduced at the beginning or the i guess part of episode one and then into episode two I'm telling you, when he was talking with those guys back and forth and showing them the medical supplies and then was trying to bribe them with some Romulan ale and everything, I'm thinking to myself, this dude's like Han Solo. Yes. I'm not even kidding you. You took the words right out of my mouth. So, yeah, I absolutely had that that same feeling. It was nice to get a little bit of, I'm going to say backstory, but a little, little bit of an insight into uh, some of some of Jack's personality traits, right, and how he is, because that gets built off of later in the episode. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, and I'm glad we got to see as much as Jack. Uh, as I, I'm glad we got to see as much of him as we did in, in the episode. I thought that was good. And I thought I think it was probably important. Right. So we, we just got introduced with him in the episode one and then seeing more of his personality here in episode two was good. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And then so after that kind of um, that entrance and of us learning about. Uh, Jack. In, in the past two weeks ago, we do jump back to the present in their current situation, in their very tenuous situation, like with, with the Shrike. And we have both Jack and Riker and Admiral Picard together trying to figure out how to get out of this situation. I, I, and I thought that was, um, there was a lot of tension in there, but uh, I thought it was, you know, it was, a little, it was, it was light. It had a little bit of lightness in there. And we, we saw Picard, you know, they're saying what is what is what is Picard doing when he was actually putting up the the inhibitors for the transporters and you don't know that until yeah. until they're trying to transport Jack off the ship. So so I thought that was kind of neat. That was clever too. I don't know what you very thought about reminiscent. That. Yeah, very reminiscent of Star Trek Insurrection with the Baku. Remember on the planet oh, okay. they put those transport inhibitors down so the Sona can't beam them off. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, very much reminded me of that exact specific scene. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I thought that that was good. So they were in really pretty much dire straits right there. Mm -hmm. They almost transported Jack off. I think they destroyed their shuttle pod at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So that was gone. Um, and at, so as this was happening for me, as this was happening and the Elios was in dire straits, I was thinking about, okay, what is captain shaw going to do is he going to do anything uh, is the titan going to do anything um you know because previous to then you know captain shaw was very adamant about hey man these guys are these are they made their decision they're on their own i'm yep you no know, i'm outside of federation space i'm not going to do anything uh so you know it ends it ends up i think a very a very satisfying and one of the things I liked was, you know, when Seven, we do see Seven trying to persuade Captain Shaw to to assist Admiral yep. Picard and, and Riker. I really liked that scene, actually, when Seven goes in um, she's, and, and talks to him. And, because she, she says something to the effect of, hey, you can either um, be remembered at, as the the captain that, let these legends die or you can be a, the hero that saves heroes. I don't know how you felt felt about that, but I, I really liked that scene. Yeah, it was a good scene. I think you, you see some of seven's character traits come out. Uh, the same traits coming out are the ones that she used in Voyager, right? In Voyager, you know, she's, she's still semi fresh, from coming out of the Borg and everything. And she has no problem voicing her opinion to anybody on the ship, especially to Captain Janeway. Captain Janeway says something. She's like, yeah, but we should do this. We should do this. And Janeway sometimes had to put it in her place, but other times seven was, was right. Se I, I think what we shouldn't um, dismiss here is I think seven of nine has very good intuition. Mm -hmm. You see that intuition in Voyager and you see that intuition here. Uh, and she's, I, I think, I'll be honest with you, Chris, and you let me know what you think about this. I think the only reason that Shaw, you know, jumps in to save them is because he realizes what Seven said is correct. 
if he lets these two die or get captured and then die, think about the optics of that. Oh, you're the captain that that could have that could have saved Picard and Riker and let them die anyways because you just didn't want to take any risks. Yeah, that's not going to go over well in in with the Federation with Starfleet. Like Picard's a big name, big name. Like you could argue at this point in history, he's maybe become bigger than Kirk. It's it's debatable. I'm not saying he is. I'm just saying you could make that argument. Mm-hmm. And so you're saying that really you're going to let them go because of your ego and you don't want to take any risks. So I think personally, I think he does the right thing, but I don't think he does it for the right reasons. If that makes any sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I think there was some fear in him a little bit too. Like he yeah. had, he, he had made a comment and we'll learn more. I'm sure about captain Shaw in these continuing seasons. He had made a comment in episode one where, hey, we're we're an exploration ship. It was something yeah. to that effect, right? We're yep. an exploration ship. So I didn't get the sense that he was someone that had experienced a, conf- a lot of conflict or combat in his in his Starfleet career as of yet. So yeah, that thinking, makes sense. So thinking maybe he had a little bit of fear in there, and he was trying to rationalize his decision, his ethical decision by by saying, okay, well I've got my crew of 500, I can't risk my crew of 500 to save these two individuals that have, um, you know, gone off on this, this tangent kind of task. So, um, but I think you are absolutely right. When seven like talks to him, uh, he realized he does realize, Oh, you know, seven is correct. And so he does, he does make the, um, the moral, I think the correct moral decision for, for that, for that moment. I'm not sure that he does it. I'm not sure he does it because he thinks it's necessarily the right reason. Mm-hmm. I think he does it because maybe fear that if they are to die and he had the chance to save them and someone like seven is going to know that, that it could ruin his own career because he just let two living legends. Cause Riker's a legend in his own, own respect. Um, and Oh, by the way, Riker's a former captain of the Titan, right? Cause this is the Titan a, yeah, this is a refit Titan, right? The yeah. Neo Constitution class. So, um, I I think his I think the reasoning is he's trying to make sure that this that this doesn't go down under his watch more than oh we should do it because they're Federation citizens and they're you know these uh these legends and stuff. He even makes a comment in the bridge before he dismisses Seven or, or Commander Hanson, right? Where he says, you know, I don't care about these basically, you know, these relics and uh you know i don't care some medals they got doesn't mean much and all this stuff i'm butchering like crazy the the the, uh, lines but something to that Mm -hmm. effect right like he doesn't he pretty much he doesn't care what they've done Mm -hmm. they're two dudes who stole a shuttle and took off and now he's supposed to go risk the whole crew i do i do in some regards see it from his perspective you know he's he does have a crew he's responsible for and regardless of what they've done in the past and who they are quote unquote I, you know, he's not, it's not like he's, oh my gosh, they're, we have to go say the president of the, you know, United Federation of Planets and something that's not, they're not them. So that's how I look at it anyways. No, that's a good, that's a good point. I, so that decision, sorry to go talk about um, philosophy here, but, but, but no, the, you know, that, that, that decision of like ut- utilitarian ethics where, where he has to consider, right, the, the good of the many over the good of the few, right? So the Vulcans that, that, in that decision. So right, right. And so if it was a Vulcan ship, the Vulcan ship may have decided, okay, we're not going to <laughs> we're we're not going to intercede. Yeah. Um yeah. I do um but the switch I do really liked that uh the visual the visual effect of the Titan coming in, like comes in between the Shrike uh and the Elios. And I thought that yep. was great. That looked great. So the they did a, just a wonderful job with that. That was exciting. It was neat to see. It's very cinematic. It was great. Very great scene. They mm-hmm. they they like jump in and break the tractor beam up. And that that image where the the Elios is kind of floating away a little bit after it's been saved, and the Titans sitting there like, yeah, yeah. what's up? Like Big Brother yeah. kind of thing, you know? Yeah, that was pre- that was pretty fantastic. Yeah, that was good. And it, and the, I thought it was really funny where um, they so they, they were scanning the Elios and trying to figure out, oh, okay, who are we gonna get beam up? And then they realized. It's four of them to beam up, and he's like, "What's four? 
Like, okay, beam them all up. I guess we're a hotel right now. So, <laughs> yeah, I love that. I like, like, that. like, we're a hotel now. We're a hotel anyways or whatever. Yeah, that line was epic. That was some yeah. major snarky sarcasm yeah. right there, which really fit perfectly. And the, t- the, way, the way it was timed was, was fantastic. Yeah, so um, it was good. He came in. He came in, got him, saved him. So that, yep. that, was, that was good. Yeah. Yeah. So we we later, we shift some moments where we go back to Rafi and I forget what planet she's on. It's the same planet. I think it's, uh, yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, she, she's there and really kind of beating herself up and blaming, blaming herself for what happened to the, the Federation recruiting center that was destroyed. And I honestly thought, uh, that more people were perished when we had seen the destruction in episode one, than than what we've learned in episode two, but that's good that not as many people had perished. So, so really good discussion. I think that Rafi had with her handler. I liked it. I liked that exchange. I don't know how you felt, uh, yeah. but, but I liked it. Um, you know, cause she's frustrated. She's getting these very, um, short, short answers from the handler that just confuse her more. Um, but, when I saw those exchanges from the handler, I don't know how you felt, but when I saw these phrases, do not seek blame, do not seek anger. So that had my mind racing. <laughs> I don't know if you, right. I wanted to know who that handler was at at that moment. Cause that sounded like when I, when I heard that, I don't know if you had already concluded or thought like who the handler was, but when I heard that, it sounded like Spock to me, but I knew it couldn't be Spock, but it sounded like, okay, that's something that, that Spock would say. But I really wanted to know who the handler was after I saw those phrases. Yeah, same. <laughs> um, certainly, uh, I think the the the, the coldness of it, right? Because you have this, this, just this person on the other end, you have no idea who they are. Mm-hmm. They're giving you your directions and your orders. You don't know, like, like you're frustrated because you can't actually talk to them. You're talking to them through basically a chat, you know, like a, a, a messaging system. And she's trying to explain, you know, like, oh, I should have done this. This should have happened, blah, 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 blah. And the handler, it, it's it's completely cold, right? It's, 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 de- it's devoid of emotion. So I, th- and that, that would be really frustrating for me if I was in that situation as Rafi, where I'm like, you know, okay, I'm trying to help, trying to do the right thing. And this person's giving me the runaround, and then, 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 of course, they've got to throw in the the name of the episode, right? Where uh-huh. the the disengage, handler says to yeah. disengage, disengage, yeah, but, and she can't, you know, she she can't take that. That's not that's not the right answer for her, right? The where it says, you know, Starfleet Command has terminated the investigation, uh, disengage, you know, and all this stuff, and she's like, what, you know, like like th- this is this is only going to get worse. I think she realizes that this attack probably wasn't the first time that this is going to the only time this is going to happen excuse me this was the first of many potentially attacks and she knows that and she knows now with her handler saying this right that that she's probably got to go get information on her own because she's not going to get it through the normal channels yeah yeah so no so, i mean we know who the handler is now which was which was awesome which was epic uh but if i think about to some of the phrases that the handler said, if you can remember that in episode one, there's that one phrase that the and that the handler says in episode one, where he says, uh, we are at war and you are a warrior. And he's, he's saying that to Rafi. And I was like, Oh, that's so cool. And us. Knowing, yeah. Yeah. Us now knowing who the handler is like, oh, I could totally see him seeing Sam. You know, I'll be honest with you. Like, I mean, okay, we, we're going to spoil it here, right? You yeah. know, it's our, our friendly neighborhood Klingon, Worf, is her handler because we see him at, you know, the end of the episode. But um, I I was not thinking Worf. In fact, I, I what I was thinking was, okay, well, we know Worf's in this. We know LaForge and Troy and, uh, we, we, you know, we, obviously Crusher's in it, like, and and I guess lore potentially. When are we going to see Worf? Right, we see this gray-haired, all grayed-out Worf. When are we going to see him? 
I was not thinking Worf in season or episode one of this season with the handler. Did you have thoughts that that could have been Worf based on what was being said? Because I'll be honest with you, I, I was not thinking that at all. I didn't have anyone in mind for the handler at the time. At, at, like episode one and episode two, when when we were just seeing the exchange, those text exchanges, I was I was thinking, oh, I don't know if we're ever going to know who the handler is. I just, I felt like, it felt very Vulcan to me, those text ex exchanges. Mm. And it felt like, it felt just, like I said, like something that I, I could hear Spock saying, you know, when he's he's giving advice. Yeah. Uh, but with Worf, totally I could hear like Worf, Worf saying that now to put it in there and to, especially that phrase, like we're at, we're at war and you are a warrior. Oh, that was, that was really that was great. Yeah. 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 So, so anyway, those, those text to change, those handler exchanges um, really didn't, I guess we're not going to have those now since they, they're, they actually met face to face. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. I, I, un, unless Worf, like, you know, he carried her out of that, that room. Right. And then takes her out. Maybe he puts her somewhere where she can recuperate and then takes off. Maybe that mm. would be a way we might still get it, but you're right. Yeah. I, I, if, if they're meeting and then she finds out that he's her handler, that that would kind of end those exchanges, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, we do get a little bit of more. So with Rafi, because she does, Rafi does not disengage, you yeah. know, um, uh, at the, at the orders of her handler, you know, she decides, okay, I'm the only one that can do this now. Uh, and, um, you know, when we think about it in retrospect, no, Worf, Worf was probably asking her to disengage for her own safety and he was still going to carry on the mission. But, but she's thinking, I'm the only one that can do this now. And, and she's trying to find a way to, um, to get to the bottom of it. So she ends up going to her ex-husband um, to, to kind of get some leads on the Franks, the Ferengi gangster Sneed. And so that's what that's what happens, and you kind of get to see a little bit more of her personality than, um, you know, when she connects with her, with her ex husband. She asks, asks about her son, but ultimately it comes down to, she has to make this choice. You know, is is uh, is she going to be able to have her husband send a message to her son, or get a lead from her husband and be able to get in to be able to see that Ferengi gangster's need. So. Yeah. Yep, she makes the the choice of um, getting the lead and being able to see Sneed. So, I did like I did like that exchange. I want. I'm curious how you felt. I did like that exchange between her her husband and and her because, you know, she's like, how did you get? You know, how did you get out of it? How did you kind of remove your mind from it? And and you know, he's he's expressing his concern on like, yeah. I, I know how you get when you're like this way, when you're thinking about conspiracies and webs and just a dark trail for you. So I, I liked that. Here's how you felt about that learning, learning a little bit more about Ralphie. Yeah. I mean, um, for me, I, I, I thought about it from my own perspective, right? If I was in a situation in real life where, you know, uh, I was told, Hey, you either have, you have to make a choice. You either, you either do this thing for your job or, see your kids and that's it there's no other option but if you if you if you see this if you see your kids that might affect your ability to continue your work if you go to the work thing your kids may be maybe maybe really angry or upset at you maybe because you're gone a lot of you know i just try to put myself in those shoes if i was in raffi's shoes me personally i, I would have chose my kid now she was obviously looking at it like I've got to go get this information because this potentially could save a lot of lives. Right. And, and she's, she is almost taking the, the perspective of the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the yeah. few or the yes. one in this case. Um, but I mean, she knows, she already knows. And we, we, I think we, I think we learned about this in season one, didn't we? Of Picard where, um, Raffi has a strained relationship with her child. I want to say yeah, we yeah. already knew. I mean, we already knew she had a child, right? And she had a strained relationship when we meet her and stuff. Um, so we already kind of know that's a thing. But the idea that she again is choosing something else other than her her child. Um, 
it was a, it was kind of heartbreaking to be honest with you. Yeah, I thought from the, from the perspective of what 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 would I have done if I was in the child situation, right? And you know, I am a, a you know estranged to to my to my mother. What would that feel like? How would you know? So that was that was a really that was a little bit of an emotional scene between her and her ex husband. Her ex husband immediately when she's pausing there, right, knows that she's she's not gonna choose her son in this case, and so. It was it was really real. That was a very emotional scene for for me personally. Yeah, yeah, it's connecting back to those that utilitarian ethical kind of decision, right? To she yep. wants to choose to to save as many people as she can. Okay, so I love the idea that uh, we're kind of getting into the idea of choice a little bit. Um, I'm c- kind of connecting this to episode one too, because we have there have been pivotal choices by a lot of our our main companions, right? So we had in episode one, you know, we had Picard's choice just to decide, Hey, let's go try and help Beverly. Right. And his, his choice is kind of prompted along by Laris saying, Hey, these are the people we chose to be. And so, so I like that episode one. We also had, we had seven's choice. Seven's choice was to disobey her captain in order to take them to the, I'm going to forget the name of the the system, uh, but the 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 writing system, I think right, it was writing system, right? Yeah. So yeah, her choice was to she trusted her gut, right, and disobeyed her captain and helped out Riker and and Picard. So that was. By another, the way, yeah, for those people who have listened to us long enough and have heard me say it enough, I can be deep. <laughs> once in a while a blind squirrel finds a nut go. <laughs> so yeah. once in a while uh, i'll try not to make it a habit though i know those you might be might be disappointed in my my take on some of this oh he's actually deep i kind of missed the uh the superficial comment no. i promise you i promise you i'll get back to that don't worry anyway sorry continue <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness and, and then so the choice by picard choice by seven and then you had shaw's choice in episode Episode two, yeah. Shaw's got to make a choice. Hey, am I going to help these guys or, or not? And he's kind of he's prompted by seven to kind of get him on that choice. And then, um, and then we had Rafi's choice. Hmm. Rafi's choice was really hard. I I think I think the decision that Rafi had to make was probably the most difficult decision faced by any of the main characters so far in season three. What do you think? Personally, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The the, yeah. the personal decision she said. I mean, the decision that, that, that Picard makes to go rescue Beverly and not go and meet up with Laris when he's supposed to, that's a tough choice for sure, because he's he's trying to, you know, move into this new this new life, right? This yeah. retired life. He's just gotten done saving the galaxy again and dealing with Q and 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 you know the timeline and all this, that and the other, and and the Borg and all that stuff, right? But um, and and that was difficult, I'm sure. But I just I don't know that there's something that 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 scene between Raffi and her ex husband and and the choice she made has really weighed on me since I first watched it. Just it's I don't want to say it's unsettling, but it's just man, like hmm. that was a tough scene, tough yeah. scene for me personally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, and we get to see more of Rafi. You know, when when Rafi actually goes into the club and kind of goes back there and meets Sneed, um, I was feeling for Rafi there. That was very uncomfortable, certainly an uncomfortable situation for her, of course. You could tell her decision really was weighing on her. Yeah. Because she knows what she did. She knows, like, her ex-husband's not going to, basically put in a good word, quote unquote, or get her, her son to talk to her. Mm-hmm. He set up this meeting because he wanted to see what choice she would make. And she chose the, the decision. She made the decision that I think he probably expected, but was hoping mm-hmm. that she'd make a different choice, which is to go see their son. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, you, I think you're right, Chris, you, you see this way very heavily on her. She becomes very cold and emotionless in this scene, probably because a, she knows she has to, but B because now all of a sudden she's hurting. I think she's really hurting because of the decision that she feels like she had to make to save lives. Yeah. Uh, Sneed 
you know, her interaction with Sneed, how I felt about Sneed, he was a very, I thought he was played very good. He was very despicable. He felt like a very despicable gang- gangster. Um, I, he actually, when I think about how the other Ferengis were played in TNG and Deep Space Nine, um, this was, uh, I think, he f- definitely felt like the most evil, uh, evil Ferengi that I've seen portrayed. Well, he yes. did pull a head out from behind the furniture yeah. of the of the Romulan dude that he, uh, you know, took his head off so that he wouldn't get sold out. Yeah, um, that was pretty significant. I mean, you think about it, right? The and Armin Shimmerman has made this comment before. The the Ferengi and TNG are much different than the Ferengi and DS Nine, and even the the one episode of Voyager, I think, called False Prophets, where yeah. they discover Ferengi in the Delta Quadrant. Um, that they're very very different. And I'm trying to remember. Oh, there were Fer- there were Ferengi and Enterprise too. Um, they they were a little more like the DS Nine ones for the most part. Um, but there there's a precedent set. I think DS Nine set a precedence for how Ferengi should look moving forward. And uh, you're right. He was very vile. He kind of reminded me, and I can't remember the name of the of the Ferengi. You remember the episode of the Magnificent Ferengi in DS9 where they collect all those different Ferengi to go to go um to go save Moogie, right? Yeah. And they have the one the one Ferengi who's like a hired gun. He just likes he he doesn't care about profit. He just wants to kill people. You remember yeah. that one? Yeah, yeah he, that he, the, uh, uh, Sneed had a little fe- had a little bit of him. I feel like in him, it felt yeah. a little bit like that. Minus the fact that he was still, you know, he still cared about profit. Yeah, obviously, he still cared about money and platinum and all that stuff. You could tell, but he kind of reminded me of that Ferengi from that episode. Yeah, yeah. yeah so after, afraid, yeah. wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, was not afraid to get his hands dirty. Was not afraid. So, um. Rafi would not have made it, I think, much longer in in that conversation with Sneed and what she gave him. He gave her drugs. That's right. To prove that she wasn't like Starfleet. Starfleet. Yeah, she he gave her drugs again. So that was that was sad to see. I didn't like that. Yeah, especially because we know she's a recovering addict, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that that I mean, think about the two decisions she had to make to try to get the job done to get this information right to find out who it was that actually you know uh set off the bomb and all the inner workings right Mm. oh gosh i mean she had to she had to relapse and she had to turn away from her son again yeah man i mean emotionally when wherever she's at in the next episode or or whenever she's in it again yeah, it's gonna it's gonna take a toll on her. It's it's, it's man, I really really feel for her in yeah. this episode quite a bit because she's she's trying to do what she thinks is right and get this information in order to help you know bring the person to justice or or, or get the weapon back or whatever whatever it is or and save lives or any number of things. Um, I really feel bad for her because she's she's putting everything on the line. She's making decisions that are affecting her family. She's making decisions that are affecting her livelihood with this idea of relapsing. I mean, this is a tough episode for her. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, let's let's go a little bit lighter. We went we went we went hard on Rafi right now. We can go a little <laughs> bit lighter. <laughs> well, I'm not being hard on her. I just feel so bad for yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in that in that those scenes with Sneed. There was some, I didn't see this, uh, but it's something that you, you saw. I don't know if you saw it, um, like if you saw it like in the first viewing, but you paused the screen and you're able to see it. Yeah, so I, of, it was not the first viewing that I saw it. I actually only saw it because it was posted on social media. Oh, okay. Okay. Why don't you tell us about that? That's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. yeah. So uh, for those of you watching, if you did not notice it, you probably didn't unless you knew about it ahead of time or paused the screen and somehow saw it. But they, they're they're pulling up the uh, I believe Raffi pulls up the or the the handler, I think, pulls up the records of these two individuals that she knows she has to go find. Right. One is Laroc uh, to Laroc uh, to, 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 to Loco to Loco. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it's not a very Romulan name to me personally. But anyways, th this Romulan guy, they pull up his info, you freeze it, and you can see stuff on there like he stole a Romulan shuttlecraft or something like that. It's served in a in like a, a Romulan juvenile facility for a year and was rehabilitated and all this. Anyways, nothing really crazy. But when they free, if you freeze <laughs> the criminal record of Sneed on the screen, it says under known associates, uh, 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 J of Earth, spelled J-A-E. And we all know that J-A-E is Lieutenant J, which we've spoken to her, Trace, Tracy Coco. If you haven't yes. watched our, our interview or listened to our interview with her, be sure to go onto YouTube for the video version or on to our, our favorite uh, podcast platforms for the audio version. So I wonder, Chris, if all the hashtags and the bring back Lieutenant J, if this was a way to get that character in there, because the only reason I found this out was I guess somebody told this to Tracy and she posted it all over and she huh. was going crazy and we were all going crazy and it was, it's fantastic. So I, I mean, I, I would be shocked if this wasn't intentional. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that means we're going to see Lieutenant J on screen because she seemed very adamant that she was not in Picard unless she's pulling our leg. But uh, I don't think we're going to see her on the screen, unfortunately. Uh, I wish we, we wish we did. But uh, seeing that J of Earth as a known associate it was like, well, wait a second. Did Lieutenant J go rogue or is she part of Section 31? And so she's on the <laughs> inside, kind of like Rafi is working with Starfleet until I don't know. It's something to kind of, uh, you know, theorize and think about in your brain. Like, what if, d does this mean the l return of Lieutenant J sometime down the road? I sure hope so. That would be pretty cool. That yeah. Would absolutely be cool. Yeah. We mentioned it in our interview with her, right, Chris, where this idea of her bringing her back and her being part of Section 31 and everything, yeah. or her being a captain of a ship at this point, you know, in the future, or at the very minimum, I think she should be a commander. Yeah, but maybe maybe even a captain of a of a of a vessel. Who knows? But yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. So yeah, well, we do go back to um, the scene with the Titan, which which I liked. You know, after yeah. after Rafi's scenes, then we go back to the Titan, which was good. You know what I liked about Captain Shaw was so a after they've beamed uh, the survivors back back on, um, he kind of he wants to know. Hey, who who are we? Who are we engaged with? You know, who are we up up against? You know, I, I like yeah. that. I like that because yeah, yeah. So it's like yeah, that's who. Let's find out who we're talking to, and that's when we do get introduced to the captain of the Shrike. So Captain Vadek, Vadek, I believe her name is played by Amanda Palmer. Yep, so that that was a. Um, that was an interest that felt interesting that whole scene right so i i thought it was interesting that she knew so when when captain shaw was on she knew oh captain liam shaw and then she made reference immediately to his psych official psychological profile saying hey i'm yeah. kind, of, kind of surprised you're still holding it together or something along <laughs> those lines right and see the, yeah you kind of see the expression on his face um, and then her reference to Admiral Picard, and there's something on. She played it well. She, I felt there's something unsettling about her mm. on that first, you know, just minute that you have with her. I'm not sure how you felt, but that was my initial reaction to her. Like, okay, she's kind of an unsettling, unsettling personality. Yeah, she. It's not ex. It's not a very not a great comparison, but she kind of reminds me a little bit, the scene, the ship, her foreknowledge of things reminds me a little bit of Shinzon from Star Trek nemesis, mm -hmm. right? He's mm -hmm. now he's a clone of Picard, but, and, and she's obviously not, but she knows too much for this to be a coincidence mm -hmm. that Picard is there. She knows too much for this to be a coincidence that even the Titan is there. Something's afoot in this situation, <laughs> right? Like something doesn't seem right. I will say Amanda Plummer's performance in this episode when we first meet this Captain Vatic was 
spectacular. Absolutely. Like the way she just played it all loosey goosey and not a care in the world because she knows the ship of hers. It just completely outmatches the Titan again, very similar to nemesis, how the scimitar outmatched the enterprise eat the member of Picard says, Oh, she's a predator, right? All mm -hmm. these weapons, uh, this cloaking device, it can firewall cloaked again. It's not an exact match, right? For this particular, um, uh, you know, comparison, but I feel there's a, it, it gave me a lot of Star Trek nemesis feels to this particular scene where we're meeting someone for the first time who has way too much, in, much information than you feel like she should. We don't know much about her. We really don't, but I have a feeling that there's got to be more to her than meets the eye. Yeah, for sure. I am so happy that in this season three so far, see how you feel but i feel like we've had more ships more vessels in these first two episodes of of picard than seasons one and seasons two combined right now more kind of our you know, visual scenes with with ships more discussion about ships i mean so captain vatic she has this whole dialogue where she's talking about her ship. You know, she, we're, we learn she wants, we learn she wants Jack Crusher for whatever reason. You know, we we haven't figured that out yet. That hasn't been unveiled, but uh, but she's giving them an ultimatum, saying, "I want Jack Crusher." Um, she said, "Here, I'm gonna I'm gonna lower my shield so you can scan my ship and let me tell you about my ship." My <laughs> ship's about called the Shrike. And, yeah, talk about pompous and arrogant, right? Right, right, and then. You know, she talks about her ship for a good minute or two. So I'm like, oh, okay, that's kind of interesting. And uh, yeah. so I like I like that. There's a lot more emphasis on on the vessels and the ships and, and Starfleet in this, and I think that's a good thing because I, yeah, it doesn't it feel like Star Trek? Like yeah. it just you know the balance of character development and uh uh harrowing situations critical decision uh decisions that have to be made starships flying around space alien i mean it just it 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 feels like trek again it really really does and and thank god for terry metallis and the ogs denise and mike akuda and doug drexler and all these people dave blasts uh and all these people working so hard to make season three feel and and um be what so many Star Trek fans have been, you know, yelling for for the last like twenty years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. That was that was good. So what we see her action, right? So so her initial action to say, "Hey, I, I want you to take me seriously," and she does the tractor beam on the Elios and throws <laughs> Elios into the Titan. I. Well, I thought that was really cool. I think it's, I think it is completely original. I, I don't, I don't recall if I'd seen something like that in any of the other series episodes where you're using a tractor beam to throw, just throw another ship, you know, throw the ship into another ship. So I think you're right. I don't, I remember a scene like that. It, it was very, uh, it was very like it. Okay, this is gonna be a really bizarre comparison, all right. But hang with yeah. me for one second, yeah. all right. Yeah. It it reminds me a little bit of the dodgeball scene in the playground of Billy Madison, <laughs> where he gets out there, right? He's so much bigger, he's so much more powerful than these kids, and he's just running around with no with care in the world, chucking the ball at these at these kids, right? Mm -hmm. It kind of reminded me of that, like, okay, you have this ship, right, that knows it's more powerful by far than the other ships, and it's just chucking ships against each other. I mean, it's it was a spectacular scene visually uh, and very, like you said, Chris, unique. I, I don't think I've seen that before. I don't know if it just their tractor beams more advanced on this ship or not to be able to do that or if other ships could have done that. We They just never came up with the idea to do it, but it was – they did. Uh, they did that. 
like it grabbed the ship and threw it into the Titan. And I was like, Oh crap. Like I literally <laughs> out loud said that I was like, man, alive. Like that was intense, you know? And uh, yeah, r- really awesome idea. You know, it's, 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 it's kind of a, it takes like a bully approach, right? Like, yeah. you know, the ship's bullying the Titan, knowing full well the Titan is doesn't stand a chance if it if it really wants to. I mean, they were talking about all these phaser banks and hundreds of torpedoes and even some weapons they had never heard of. So, yeah, it, it, this this ship and this this Captain Vatic knows that she is in control right now yeah. and she has the upper hand. And Titan is hosed if they don't do what she says. Yeah, and they are, they're only given an hour, right? She she gives she gives the Titan an hour to say, "Hey, hand over the boy uh, in an hour." And so, and then they get an hour to try and figure out what to do what to do with them. And Captain Shaw is like inclined inclined to think, "All right, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna give him over, <laughs> so yeah, so I can save save the crew." And um, and then we get the scene with Picard. A little, a little bit with Picard and and Jack. A little bit later, um, we get the scene. We get the scene about Jack, where apparently he's got some shady history, and he's yeah. quit, right. So he's for doing all kinds of bad things, and he's at. He called him. What did Shaw call him? Like a a galactic fugitive. It was something like something that. like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah had a like had a little bit of a Star Wars feel to it. Yeah, yeah, it did. It did. I did like the scene with uh, Picard and Jack. Yeah, how, how you felt, but uh, you know, you sense the desperation in Picard on trying to figure out. Hey, I'm trying to save this this man so he just doesn't get turned over to this other Captain Vatic, and um, Jack deserves a trial. You sense that frustration, and at the end, you know, he says. Like, who's your father? And Jack says, I don't know. So I like that. I don't know how you felt. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was an interesting scene in Picard sitting there, you know, as he's in the brig and, and mm-hmm. talking to, to Jack uh, behind the force field and saying, you know, I've got a fig- I've got X number of minutes, you know, 15 minutes or whatever it was to figure out what we, what to do with you. Um, and, it's a, it's, it is, it's a, it's an interesting scene. You, you can see, I think you can see a bit of, um, a bit of desperation, a bit of frustration, and a bit of empathy in Picard's eyes during that scene. Mm-hmm. I, I, I definitely, I, I kind of got that vibe from him. What, it, what it, is that? You kind of get that vibe, or did you get something different from him? I got a similar vibe. I got the vibe that. Picard was already suspecting that Jack was, you know, his son, and he's just trying to to un- unveil that. Um, I can't remember if this is before or after he had already talked, or Riker was already talk talking him saying, when Riker was talking to Picard saying, "Can't you see what's like right in front of you? Can't you see what I'm seeing?" And and Picard's like, "You know, what are you saying?" Well, or, um. Yeah, they were hitting. They were hitting at it pretty hard, weren't they? <laughs> they were hitting at it very hard. Yes. Oh gosh, they were they ever clearly. Yeah. So, I, I, the, I sensed when. I kind of sensed that he already knew it in his gut and his heart when he said, "Who's your father?" And Jack says, he said something like, "I, I don't, I don't, I never had one. Either yeah. I never had one, or I don't know." Yeah, I think it's something like I never had one. Yeah. Yeah, and then in Picard, I could sense like okay, in his gut, he kind of knows. Yeah, so that's what I was. That's what I was thinking. That's what I was feeling. Yeah. Yeah. The um, that scene where it happens, right? Picard leaves, and then Jack breaks out. Mm-hmm. Fool, fool fools the the dumb security officer. Now, here's what's really funny. The the scene where Jack is running to get off the ship in a different tra- in a transporter room, the transporter operator in that room. I only know this because I saw it on social media first. <laughs> then I watched it. The actor playing it is a guy named Chad Lindbergh. 
who mm-hmm. was in Fast and the, the first Fast and the Furious movie. He was in, uh, I believe, Supernatural, a bunch of other stuff. He's from my hometown where I grew up, <laughs> Burlington, Mount Vernon, Washington, where, where I'm from originally. And I, I I was in martial arts class with him. I was in karate with him. I, I I knew him back in the day when he was younger. He was a young black belt when I was a kid, um, taking classes. And so, uh, yeah, I I know I know Chad. Uh, I don't know him like we're friends or anything, but I I know him, and yeah. that was pretty cool. Like once once the episode came out and he could reveal that because obviously he'd been saving that for a while. That was yeah. pretty. That was pretty freaking awesome to see like the the image he had of like the side shot of his face in the transporter room wearing that Starfleet uniform. That was badass. That's cool. That was ba- that was pretty cool. Like a guy from my hometown was just in Star Trek Picard, so it's pretty neat. That's pretty. That's an awesome connection, man. That yeah, for cool. sure. Really, really cool. Uh, I, I'm happy for happy for Chad. I'm gonna try to reach out to him and <laughs> tell him tell him I think that was so awesome that he was in Star Trek he, Picard. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was in the transporter room when, when Seven comes in and points the phaser at, at Jack to try to keep yeah. him from leaving the ship or whatever, you know. So that was was pretty was pretty neat, pretty cool. And Jack's Jack's making a choice too because right because Jack's thinking, hey, I'm going to transport myself, and they talk about they talk about that. I'm going to transport myself onto the um, the Shrike to save to save all these other people. That other utilitarian kind of ethical decision. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Um, so uh, should we get on to the? I, yeah. I, I I'll be honest with you. I kind of saw this coming. I, I really did. Just the first time we in episode one when we first see the guy because it's and he reveals he's Beverly's son. I'm like, well, Beverly probably wasn't out like hooking up with guys and like you know, or or I I I don't see her marrying somebody or finding mm-hmm. a spouse. But shall we get on to the quarter? unquote bombshell that we get at the end of this episode yeah we should we should well and and on the bridge right when Bever when beverly comes and on onto the bridge and you see them kind of look at each other and have that what unspoken you, yeah what was your what was your thoughts and feelings on that scene because i have mine but i'm curious to hear your thoughts and feelings um of them locking eyes on the bridge of the titan for the first time in a couple decades yeah I actually watched that scene probably four times. Oh wow! All right, because they they don't actually exchange dialogue. No. Yeah, they they don't. Yeah, not so, not in th- not in this episode. I'm, yeah, I'm assuming they will, obviously, maybe the next one, but not this one. Yeah. So you, you go in there and you know they have this deep deep connection, and you see her coming, and you see them look at each other, and you know, like I said before, Picard already sensed in his gut that he was he was the father um so you have that kind of look of of inquiry because he's wondering himself and when she come comes and looks at him um he's, she's kind of confirming it for him you know sim- similar to when in the tng in the next generation episodes where when she's concerned about wesley you know when when Wesley kind of gets into dire situations, um, and she's concerned, and the captain has to make a decision. There's, there's this expression on her face, uh, when she's talking to the captain. It's kind of the same, uh, in this in this episode on um, when she came on the bridge, and I love I did love that there didn't need to be any dialogue. They were just looking at each other, and. You know, when she looks at him, she's just kind of like confirming, "Yes, it's your son." So, Very powerful scene. Yeah, yeah, I thought, I thought so. So I did, I did like, I did like that. I think that that was probably my favorite scene of the episode. Hmm. Even though there's no dialogue or anything, it's just their energies connecting, right? And they're kind of consciousness connecting do you remember that episode this this came up in my thoughts as soon as the the scene happened do you remember that tng episode where picard and crusher are literally linked and they can hear each other's thoughts yeah and they yeah i i immediately thought of that Mm. like you know i would think even though it's not really referenced the rest of tng or in the movies i kind of feel like 
maybe there's some residual connection there because of that. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. they have a history together, right? They were friends. They kind of tried the romance thing, but it didn't really seem to work. But that kind of that kind of came back and and made me think, like you know, like I wonder if there's some residual effects of that that could mm -hmm. still be there, and mm -hmm. that's what's going on, right? That connection that. Maybe they're not hearing each other's thoughts like they did in that episode, but they're, you know, there's a sense there that maybe wouldn't have been had that event not happened. Yeah. So it was a very powerful thing. I'll be honest with you. I, when they revealed that Jack was Beverly's son, I immediately thought there's a chance this could be Picard's son. Right. If he talked about how they 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 kind of fizzled out and everything a couple 20 some years ago, they're kind of making him out to be about that age, even though I think the actor in real life is like 40 or something like that, I think. Mm -hmm. or, but they're kind of making him out to be this young, you know, 20 something kid. It would kind of fit. So I don't know if you thought that in, that, that that was a possibility at all when you first heard that he was her son. But I instantly thought, well, okay, is Beverly just going to have a kid with anybody? Probably not. That's not her MO, right? I think that if anybody she would have had a kid with, it would have been Picard. And, of course, I mean, the fact that his name is Jack, that would be an homage from both of them to her deceased husband because Jack served under Picard on the Stargazer. And, of course, there's a whole history with the three of them, right? Yeah. So I think that would have been, you know, I think that would have been appropriate. So what are your did did you have those thoughts at all? Yeah, I felt that it was leading up to that. I I felt that it was gonna somehow tie in to Picard personally. If they I mean, if you're bringing in Beverly and if you're if it's a situation where they haven't seen each other for the last whatever it was, 25, 25 years. Yeah. 30 years, I don't remember. And then there's a, a son in there, I thought, okay, somehow it's so somehow it's connected. So I immediately kind of felt felt the same. Yeah, it was. I I think if you didn't see it coming, it would have been a bombshell. I think that the average you know Trekkie probably had some thoughts that that could be the case. Yeah. So for me, it, for me, it wasn't like you know completely unexpected. But I was I had two thoughts. I was wondering one, is this going to eventually lead to him being Picard's son, or two? What if they're they're making you think that he's Picard's son and he actually isn't? And they're doing doing this just to get you thinking a certain way, and then bam, they change direction to make something unexpected. They they still could do that, right? Picard says that Jack's his son. But has he heard Beverly say that? No. Now they had the they had the exchange in the bridge. So there's kind of that 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 feeling that. You know, this probably is the case, but I still think there is a slight possibility they're doing this to make you actually think it's the case and he's not. I still believe that, yeah, Jack's Picard's son. They've kind of made him, they've kind of given him some Picard traits, but I guess there is that possibility they could be trying to lead you into that thinking only to take your knees out from underneath <laughs> you. <laughs> I would, so. I would actually be disappointed if they did that. I thought yeah. that, yeah. Too much build up I, to do that. It'd be a real kind of a slap in the face. Yeah. Because I, I thought that the scene with Picard and Beverly, that unspoken, no dialogue scene, and them just feeling each other's energies. I, 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 I'd I be disappointed if he wasn't his son now after that. Uh, but I, you know what I, what I liked was after he came to that realization, because Captain Captain Shaw was about to, I think, hand over Jack to you. Yep. Like, and I really like that. So Picard said, "Belay that order." Uh, like Ad Admiral says, "Belay that order," and he immediately like took charge of the situation. We did get an engage too from Picard. We so did. That was great. <laughs> yeah. Was, On a lighter awesome. note. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But he took charge of the situation. Um, took control, took command, and then. I think it was Shaw that asked him, why are you doing this? And he says, oh, because he's my son. And then I was I was kind of pleased with 
Shaw's reaction because Shaw was like, okay. You know, he's kind of, okay, well, right, shields up, here we go. Yeah, <laughs> right. it's, almo- it's, it's, it's almost as like Shaw's kind of throwing his hands up and being like, all right, I, I give up. Like, I can't, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I can't keep this, this constant. It, or it could have just been, you know what, like, all right. Uh, you know, maybe he had enough respect for him to say, yeah, because remember, he, remember, he 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 mentioned this several times in episode one. Well, you retired admiral. You're not really an admiral anymore. You're retired admiral. But now all of a sudden he's like, oh, OK, so that part maybe is just he he's just like, you know, all right, screw this. Like, whatever. I mean, you know, at this point, he's probably just like it ain't worth the, the juice ain't worth the squeeze anymore at this point. So, well, he was he was like. It's all on you now, Admiral. Whatever happens yeah. now, it's all on you. Yeah, maybe yeah. that's his thought too. Was like, you know, okay, well, if you're gonna do this, then it's the, the it's gonna be on your conscience if anything ha- bad happens. Yeah. It's it's I, I'm 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 absolving myself of this. I'm washing my hands. I'm I'm. It's on you now, buddy. But at least he wasn't um, combative. You know, at least he wasn't like uh, trying to get in the way after that. After after Picard said he's my son. It's like okay. <laughs> Okay, yeah. I'll do what I can to help. So yeah, that may, maybe that changes mind. We, we don't know much about Captain Shaw yet. We don't yeah. know if he has a family back back on Earth or anything like that. You know, I mean, that could have that w- could have played into it if he was a father himself. Who knows, right? Well, well, I'm assuming we'll f- continue to find out more about Shaw, just like we find out more about Captain uh, Vatic. Yeah. yeah. So, so the so so they end up going into the nebula like shortly after that, so that. uh so that they can hide in the nebula and the Shrike has to follow them. Yep. Um, and I liked that scene. Now, as they were going to, I don't know if you picked this up and I don't know if I, I don't know if I just imagined it, but a, as they go into the nebula, as the Titan goes into the nebula, there's a little bit of a, either a musical cue or a sound cue. And when I heard it, it told totally took me back to wrath of khan i'm hmm. gonna i gotta watch it again to see if that cue is there but there was some sort yeah. of musical cue in there where it reminded me of wrath of khan and hmm. i gotta see if i'm just imagining it or or what or if maybe people felt the same i'd have to go back and listen because i i don't uh i don't remember, remember thinking that but it could have been there and i just i just forgot which is t- entirely possible <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have to go back and listen that because yeah. now that you mentioned that, I'm gonna have to have to listen for myself because that that would be really cool if there was. Yeah, yeah. But now, and now, so now it seems like they're gonna go into a nebula chase. So we'll see what happens, right? Which we've seen that before. We saw it. In, we saw it in in Wrath of Khan. We've seen it in uh, Star Trek Insurrection, as well. You know, between yeah. the Enterprise E and the and the uh, the Sona ships. Yeah. Right, and then they use the ram scoops and they blow the dust back. The the Gas no, back no, that's right. yeah, 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 yeah. So we've had some good nebula, ch- or, or or how about how about the uh, hiding in the nebula against the Borg and best of both worlds? There's another yeah. nebula esque. I mean, there's several cases of the nebulas being used to hide in, or they fought, get fought in. So yeah, certainly an opportunity for some epic, you know, you know, sequences visually between these two ships in in a nebula, hiding and searching, and you kind I of guess it. Hope. Yeah, at the academy, if they ever teach like Starfleet battles at the academy, there should be like a semester on, on using nebulas. <laughs> Go find a nebula and hide there. Yeah, but what's yeah. interesting though, if you think about it, it would kind of make sense, right? Because okay, we know the Titan is outmatched. Uh, they're they're not a match physically yeah. for for the for the ship, um, and maybe by going in there, this gives them an opportunity to evade, and maneuver around and get away from the ship without being you know just destroyed or 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 having a ton of casualties so if you think about and and they haven't said much about the the nebula but maybe the nebula gives them a little bit of an advantage hopefully yeah um and they can use that going forward um because we know nebulas have been used in the past for hiding and so forth so it, it that could very well be a, actually a really good decision to go into the nebula in this case. And we'll have to find out in episode three, which we'll also be reviewing. Yeah, that'll be good. Yeah, I think yeah. going into the nebula was their only decision. It was either I, hand, handing over Jack or going into the nebula. But here's also the thing, though. Think about this, okay? There was a comment made that the Titan can go warp 9.999. Uh-huh. So the, 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 uh, the ship, the Shriek 
couldn't overtake them because that'd be going warp 10. And we just saw that episode with, with, uh, with um, Tom Paris and Voyager about trying to go, you know, break the warp 10 barrier and everything. If that's the case and they just turn around and took off and went to warp 9.999, that other ship couldn't catch them because they wouldn't be able to overtake them. They wouldn't be able to go faster than that to overtake them and catch up. Mm -hmm. uh, something, some food for thought. Yeah, they could. I guess they could have outrun them. But that would change the plot of the show. So maybe, you know, for plots purposes, the Nebula was the best bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we'll see so, what yeah. happens. Yeah. 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 So as we wrap up our review of season three, episode two of Picard, give me some uh, or give give the audience, Chris, some some of your final thoughts. Um We've watched the first two episodes now. In particular, we're talking about, about episode two here. But mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts? Do you have any sort of expectations or any sort of uh, preconceived notions or anything that you're expecting going into the next episodes, episode three? I don't have any expectations going into ex episode three. Actually, I'm going to go in cold because I want to be surprised. I want it to be fresh. I want to be new. So I'm kind of approaching it that way strategically for myself. Um, but if I was to think about how I felt about this episode two, I really enjoyed the introduction of Worf in there. I thought that was great. Yeah. I thought he looked uh, like John Wick. <laughs> no, he Just did go in there slicing people yeah. up and yeah. slicing he, heads off the Ferengi. Yeah. And he, um, when I saw, cause I've watched that scene a couple of times, he moved effortlessly which I loved, mm. right? And so it was effortless movement to kind of take out all of those other, the gangsters that were in the club. Uh, and this was a different type of movement than we have seen uh, Worf do before, right? So it was, it was, it was just pure um, kind of artistry in motion uh to to take out the gangsters and i i think this is Worf, Worf's evolution right so yeah no I wasted love, energy for sure no wasted energy and beautiful movement and i like i like seeing that so like seeing it evolve so eager to see what Worf has because um those phrases that he had used you know do not seek blame do not seek anger i want to see how how he has developed as a character over the years um yeah now i i don't think this is gonna be a surprise for you maybe because i i'm letting this episode sit with me i don't think i liked it as much as uh that you may have liked um because i'm still feeling out so if we did you know so we discovered jack is the card's son mm -hmm. right and I'm still kind of feeling out how I feel about that. So, so Beverly and Picard separated for 25 years, and then, and then he realizes, oh, I have a son. There's a lot of uh, uh, sadness there, right, and, yeah. and kind of tra tragedy there. And uh, I'm just trying to feel out how how I feel about that kind of revelation. I mean, mm. as far as as far as characters and you know what happens and and the ships and seven really really enjoyed seven i really enjoyed Riker in there um and i enjoyed learning more about jack uh but i think just that premise that oh, okay now we have learned that picard has had has had a long lost son that changes everything and i think i think i have to acknowledge that there is like some there's sadness and there's loss in that, right? Because yeah. I mean, you would want to know if you're the father of, of, of someone. And then there's complications that come with that too, with with his involvement with Laris. So all, all of that has made me think about this episode in kind of a different, maybe from a different perspective going, I was kind of sad about it. Yeah. So that's, yeah. I, that's why I felt I, I feel like, oh, I, I don't think I feel felt the same as as you may have felt about this episode. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I um, 
So I look at this episode in a couple of ways. I, I I do think you're right when it comes to Picard having a son. It does change everything. I think it does just further the the idea of of the the tragedy that has made up Picard's life that we've learned about, right? With his his um his mother and father and that whole thing. His is is his closed offness. If that's not really a word, but you know what I mean. His his mm-hmm. how closed off he's been. He's really hasn't allowed himself to love, you know, obviously we, we kind of learn, uh, Laris really cared for him and he kept Laris kind of arm's length until the end of season two. Um, and you know, he tried that with Beverly, he tried to have a romance with Beverly and it just never really worked out. Um, I, Picard's life for as amazing of a captain he is, is filled with tragedy. And I think that's one of the themes I take away so far from the first couple of seasons of Picard going into season three. And now even these first two episodes, it's full of tragedy, full, a lot of tragedy, a lot of heartbreak, a lot of sadness uh, in his life. He's got some great things, you know, with the relationship with his crew and or ex crew now, I guess, and Riker and all that kind of stuff. But there's a lot of tragedy in his life. Um, It does change everything. You're right with with him, you know, obviously having this or it looks like he has a son now. Um, I, I like some of the new characters they, they've, they've brought in Captain Shaw it keeps things interesting, <laughs> uh, yeah. and, and, and keeps things, uh, uh you know, uh, I don't want to say light, but you know, he's, he's challenging, he's challenging Picard and Riker on the fact that they, because, of the, because of who they are, they can just do whatever they want. Um, he, he, Captain Shaw is very principled with, with certain types of things and he expects things to be a certain way. He's a captain. It's his ship. And, you know, get that. Um, I, if I have any expectations for episode three, I think my expectations would be, you know, I'm looking, I'm expecting us to, to get a, a level of deep dive into this, this new trio of relationships between Picard and Beverly and his son, uh, Jack, um, as well as learning more about uh, Vatic, this captain, there, there, there's, there's got to be a lot more to her than meets the eye. There, she knows too much. This is, there's too much coincidence in the way things are, ha- are happening. She's too relaxed and, and uh, you know, kind of laid back in a situation like this. In order, you know, it's almost like she knows exactly what's going to happen, or she, she's just, she's so confident in her ship and her 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 uh the technology that she has that there's just too much going on for her to be just randomly showing up to get this guy there's something more involved between jack captain vadic maybe maybe he did a deal with her and doesn't want to admit it and now she's trying to collect on i mean there's there there's more than meets the eye here so my expectations are to further dive into that, to this this dive into to Beverly and Picard's first time talking in 20 some years mm-hmm. and their son. And then, you know, Riker obviously saw something. He he realized that that, yeah, I think this could be his son. How does that play in? And then eventually getting to the point at some point in the season where where we they bring Laris back in, probably the end of the season, I would get imagine. Mm-hmm when this kind of has all been, a lot of this has been flushed out. So those are probably my expectations. They're not high expectations. They're just, I would expect more of that. And I don't think that's unreasonable by any means. Yeah. You know what I like about Riker and kind of some of the things he has said in these episodes, right? Riker says to Picard, he's like, can you not see what I'm seeing? Uh, so <laughs> yeah. he's, he's kind of look, he's looking at everything like a, he's got a great perspective and in, in his objective. And then some situations he says, he says something like, can everyone take a breath for a moment or can everyone take a breather? So I love that. I love that. <laughs> Riker kept it light in this episode. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and Riker knows Picard so well, right. That he can see those traits, those character traits in Jack that he sees in, in Picard. He knows him so well, right. He probably knows Riker probably knows Picard better than just about anybody. And so uh, I think it's, it's, you know, if he thinks something's pretty obvious about Jack, then it, he's probably on to something, which we learn he was. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this was uh, this was this was an interesting um, second episode. Uh, I think there there's some a couple things were answered, but still a lot more stuff to be answered. 
as we move in into the next episode, uh, episode three. And um, if you're listening out there for the first time ever in the Random Red Shirt podcast's history, we are doing an episode by episode review of a series. Uh, in this case, season three of Picard. So, um, yeah, Chris, we we got a lot more to go. I'm excited to see what's coming next. Uh, you know, uh, season one and two of Picard, I would watch the, each of the next episodes, but I didn't really get like super, super, you know, jived or excited or whatever for the next one. Mm-hmm. But but this season, I am. I I I'm really curious to see where this goes. There's a lot of really complex relationships, a lot of complex things happening. It's going to be really interesting to see where you know Terry Metalis and the rest of his crew take this. Yeah, it will. It absolutely will. You know, um, in the after show that I watched, they gave props to um, uh, to Doug Drexler as well as part of the uh, as part of the OG ship design. So I love that hearing that. Um, and they gave a lot of props to the production designers. So that was that was neat to hear. Yeah, Dave Blass. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, if you're watching this episode and you have not watched our our second interview we've done with Doug Drexler, the Academy Award winning makeup artist and 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 Star Trek royalty, the, one of the OGs of Star Trek, um, recommend you go back and watch that. Uh, you can watch it on our YouTube. You can you can listen to it obviously on our podcast platforms. Um, but be sure to go listen to that. He's a wealth of knowledge, and we always love talking to Doug. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So, all right, Chris. Well, this was great. Uh, it was awesome to be able to do a, a, another deep dive into the next episode. And we look, look forward uh, to chatting more with all of you again, coming soon. When we talk about episode three uh, next week. So uh, I think the first, this, the first episode review we did, we, we recorded it and it came out on Sunday morning, mm-hmm. uh, late, late morning. So I think uh, if, if you're watching this, it's probably going to be airing again on, uh, on Sunday morning. So be sure to uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, be on the lookout for probably the following Sunday where we where we release our episode three reviews. So we look forward to doing that as well. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So, uh, all right, Chris. Well, episode two's down. Yes. Two, two down and, and and several more to go but as, as we wrap, work our way through Picard season three. And uh, look forward to hearing your thoughts on the next episode review. Well, we'll just do it cold like this. I think, I think it works out. It makes, it makes it pretty fun. Yeah, because it's completely... Um... We get to hear each other's fresh reactions and and raw too, so it's pretty pretty interesting. Yeah, and if you're watching or listening, you're hearing our reactions pretty raw too, because I have not shared my thoughts or feelings about this uh, with really anybody, um, at least to the to the detail yeah. that we're talking about here on the podcast. So, yeah, we look forward to it. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for watching and or listening. Uh, as always, be sure to go to Facebook and Instagram and follow us on there. Like whatever the button is that, that's <laughs> on that platform. If you're listening, be sure to jump over to YouTube. Subscribe to us on there for future videos as we continue to uh, to work in video into our podcast. And if you're watching us on YouTube, thank you so much. Be sure to hit the like and subscribe button here on the Random Richard Podcast for more amazing content in the future. And we look forward to uh, to sharing more amazing uh, uh reviews and uh, celebrity guest interviews man chris we have mm-hmm. a queue lined up of some people coming down the road that we can't wait to share with you as soon as we can uh as soon as we can i can't believe it it's awesome we're so thankful for them yeah we really really are man i'm telling you we're so blessed and fortunate and uh, we really can't wait to share those uh, upcoming interviews with you you're gonna love them you're just going to go crazy. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have a great time with those future guests. And uh, as soon as we can announce some of them, we will absolutely be sure to do that. So you can uh, look forward to those and set your alarms for those future interviews. So thanks everybody as always. And we will uh, catch you next time right here on the random red shirt podcast.